Chapter 28. A Princely Prize Getting the information out of the prince proved far easier than expected. He mounted his whole pedant non-cooperativeness set up at first, but he broke down quickly after Hassan threatened to bury him alive in salt. As it turned out, each emerald had a word of activation inscribed inside, which could be read if put under light at the correct angle. Once pronounced, the wearer would gain full access to the alum bound to the gems for a telepathic link. Ignoring the prince's demands for better wine, Hassan and Jack walked out and took the flying carpet to check on the loom again. Jack took an emerald and Hassan the other two. After some casual inspection, managed to get the words, which they uttered as they flew above the brass golems. One by one, they came to life, as the whole brass battalion pointed their glowing emerald eyes up in their directions. It was decidedly unsettling. A nearby traveller hurried away on his camel. Hassan was awestruck with the newfound power. Imagine all we could do with this. We could bring Katapesh to its knees. Indeed, said Jack. But what if? He closed his eyes for a moment thinking and then a third of the loom began dancing the thriller. After the appropriate slapping, we spent part of that session setting things straight. I told the party that their contacts in Katapesh informed them that the remaining Pact Masters had enough of their jibber-jabber and were about to mount an attack on Saltspit. So they gathered to plan a defense. Having 60 loom would indeed prove useful, but considering the Pact Masters probably had a lot more on their surface, plus a myriad of other means ranging from angry Katapeshi nobles to nefarious devices no one knew about, five dozen brass golems just wasn't going to cut it. They tried to get the night hags to chip in, but as expected they refused to do anything outside of their contract. Particularly since all the trouble they had stirred up in Katapesh had ended up affecting Bin Feshir's business and in fact was causing troubles on the extra planar nightmares two souls two gems deal. The Brass Legion took some extra cash to prepare, but the party knew they wouldn't be much more than a barely loyal meat shield. Al Sharingen got some of his own men involved and through the militia recruitment managed to get a few hundred highly unreliable hands. The forges were put to work double time to make enough equipment for the Saltspit Defense Force, SDF, and the markets were depleted of all swords, hammers, helmets, butter knives, and peeing pots. Bab Ganoush of the Spellcasters Union was convinced to get his magic users organized into an arcane militia in exchange for a sizable payment bonus. The Slave Master's clique also got its own bonus after negotiating the involvement of its members in the SDF. After all, some of the meanest inhabitants in Salzburg worked there. The slaves tried to organize themselves into the Brotherhood of Involuntary Workers and get a deal out of the whole matter, but a pack of angry gnolls was set loose in their quarters to sort things out. Speaking of gnolls, some of the marauding tribes the company used to hire for muscle jobs were brought in as well. All in all, the SDF managed to become a rather respectable army, counting at around 1,500 footmen, 60 golems, about 90 spellcasters, though just about a third of them could be said to be actually dangerous, 300 gnolls, a few dozen hyenodons, a handful of trained harpies, five hill giants, and a bunch of resourceful PCs. Yet, when the Pact Masters arrived in the company of every single loom in Katapesh, some 300, including a couple of giant ones that everyone thought were just statues standing outside of the Pact Masters' minarets, as well as a battalion of mercenary Batazu, led by a fallen angel, it somehow felt small. Chapter 29 Stand down and die, STC. Besides Vorgok, who was hardly stopped from charging in alone, the party wanted to negotiate a way out. However, there was no room for niceties. Though the Pact Masters were aware of what exactly had happened, they had managed to receive warning signals from their associates before being tracked into flesh spawns. Worse yet, they believed the STC to be in league with other denizens of Lang, which made the whole thing crystal clear. They had been trying to undermine Katapesh from the very beginning in order to strip them of their power. As the Pact Masters count themselves among the most powerful denizens in Galarian. So the STC had to be wiped out. Jack and Rakim volunteered to approach the Pact Masters on the flying carpet to attempt a deal, getting ambushed by devils when they got too close. After getting sight of that, Vorgok charged away and, after some hesitation, Hassan gave the order to attack. I remember Valinar's player rather troubled, saying that they were going to lose all they had worked so hard for. So yes, the table was rather grim for that session. We ended it in a cliffhanger as it was getting late and battle would surely take long. 
One of the reasons I like to stop sessions in cliffhangers sometimes is to both give everyone a sense of tension and to make them eagerly await the next meeting, and give them time to think. So I tend to do it mostly when I know they're in big trouble. This case was no exception. The next session, Hassan and Jack asked me about fallen angels, and we talked about how they end up like that after betraying their calling and becoming compelled by the burden of sin to act as they do. Next, Jack used some bardic lore regarding mercurial waters and whether they could cleanse really ugly sins, to which I said yes. From that point, their plan was rather evident. On a seemingly unrelated topic, Prior to starting the session, Hassan also asked about what happened to the conjunction of the quasi-elemental plane of vacuum and the negative energy plane. I recalled about how that place was supposedly known as the point where death and nothingness meet. How the Doomguard, Planescape faction, had erected the most fearsome fortress precisely in the last point before the place where something could exist, and how it effectively meant absolute and utter oblivion. When we finished that conversation, I had the nagging feeling he didn't just ask me that out of pure curiosity. Hassan's player tends to dislike the whole inner plane stuff, probably because I used them to torture the group with a lot of puzzles related to it and he never managed to solve them, but that plan wasn't so obvious to me. So, Jack and Rahim spend the first part of the session fighting through the progressively more horrible devils on their flying carpet. The monk had become considerably stronger after his gorillification, and he was smashing skulls left and right, while Jack made use of the skill points spent in fly to get the carpet moving swiftly among spiky chains and horned monstrosities. Eventually, they made their way to the Beatu's leader, an appropriately edgy fallen angel with excessive use of eyeliner, with Jack orbiting him as fast as he could to avoid his spells. Rahim took the mercurial water and used his highly powerful gorilla legs and absurdly high acrobatics roll to propel himself through the sky, and land a choking grip on the falling angel, smashing the vitals on his head and letting the water take his sins away. Lots of hissing, screaming, and falling took place in a short period of time, but eventually light broke through the menacing clouds, and Rimmel evacuated the fallen angel's face, who got a hold of himself just enough to avoid having both smashed against the desert ground. After an emotively cheesy speech, the redeemed angel took onto his army of devils and gave his life to sever the link that held them to his plane, sealing the wobbles between dimensions and instantly dissipating the entire B2 force. While the Illum kept fighting, and in truth they were winning with or without the devils, the sudden dimensional blockade left the Packmasters wavering, to which Jack quickly reacted and shot the carpet in their direction. Slish, slash, and some gorilla fist to the face, and their emeralds were all taken, sending the whole Illum army into a sudden halt. It took some seriously lucky saves and fly rolls for them to avoid most of the spells, furiously thrown their way by the Pact Masters, but once they managed to get behind their lines, a flurry of fireballs and magic missiles coming from the spellcasting battalion covered their asses. Without waiting any longer, they checked for the words carved into the gems and began calling them out, rapidly gaining control of the Pact Masters' Illum army, and sending them in their direction. One of the colossal Illum got a hold of one of the Pact Masters and squished it against the ground, only to be repeatedly stomped by hundreds of brass feet afterward, while the rest managed to escape inside a tornado of sandy wind, as all forms of teleportation had been blocked by the angel's final actions. An eerie silence swept over the battlefield, as in a matter of minutes all enemies had disappeared. Some drunken brass mercenaries were fighting between themselves, but otherwise everyone felt rather out of place. After gathering his forts, Hassan just waved a hand and told Whipmaster Concaf to sound the horn to send everyone back home. Payment will be handled by the House of Public Services tomorrow morning. Order all of the taverns and wenching houses in the city to make their products freely available for the night, at expense of the Saltspit Trading Company. Latrines will also be open to anyone in need. The Saltspit Defense Force is dismissed. Valinor announced, shouting his lungs out which drew a multitude of cheers and happy chants from the army.